Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here today. I'm talking about MOSS, which is a new mobile shell. Uh, it's like SSH, this guy, except it supports roaming. It lets you have inter intermittent connectivity, and it, uh, it produces a much better user interface. So let's talk about sort of the status quo. We're not going to get into the prehistory, but who here has, has used SSH to connect from one computer to another? All right, let's call that everybody. So we all know about SSH. It uses TCP. It connects the two uh, computers together. Whatever you type at the local terminal gets sent via TCP to the remote host, and whatever the, whatever the application prints comes back to your screen. All the user interface comes from the server, including whatever you type. You have to wait for those packets to go to the network and back to even see what you're typing. Uh, so this, this was great in 1995, but it's produced a lot of problems uh, based on what's happened uh, with the Internet over the last 17 years, which is a lot. You can't roam with SSH. If you're at work and you put your laptop to sleep and you bring it home, you don't have your connection anymore. You can't even roam from one Wi-Fi network to another or from Wi-Fi to cellular. You, um, and SSH, because it runs over TCP, responds poorly to packet loss. So if you're on one of these terrible networks, like on Amtrak, you really can't expect to use SSH. We argue that the root cause of this is that this octet stream, which, which SSH sends, it's really the wrong layer of abstraction for this kind of application. If you're the client, you want to see the latest screen from the application. What is the current contents of the screen? Uh, if you have an interruption in your connectivity for, let's say, five seconds, you, know, you really just want to know, what should I be looking at now? Uh, but SSH doesn't understand what it's sending, so it has to send you everything the application has printed out. It could be megabytes uh, just to get you to that current screen state. Uh, and TCP, of course, fills up all these network buffers, so then you're getting all this output from a runaway process and your control C, control, this is not a new problem, I think, to anyone here, and then it keeps coming, and this is just terrible. Uh, and trying to type, you know, when you have these huge delays, today's networks, it's not like, you know, the ARPANET, which was, was you know, much faster. Um, <laughs> Today we've measured with Verizon's top product, their 4G LTE, we've measured delays of 40 seconds around trip time when you have one TCP download happening. So trying to type where you only see what you're typing 40 seconds later, that's, that's terrible. So here's what we built. We built two things. The first is a new protocol to synchronize not octet streams but objects. It's object synchronization protocol. And the goal is to have the lowest latency possible. In the presence of client roaming, uh, you, can, you can put it to sleep for an hour or, or 10 hours, fly to Europe, wake it up again. You can have a lossy network path. We try and do our best to synchronize abstract objects. And number two, we use that protocol to build this mobile shell application, Mosh, uh, that has a, a local user interface. So when you type, you see what you typed immediately. So let's talk about part one, the protocol. We call it the state synchronization protocol. Uh, it runs over UDP, and it synchronizes the state of, of abstract objects. Uh, so the protocol doesn't have to know the inner details of these objects, but the object has to support a, a simple interface. The SSP has to be able to inquire of the object, hey, uh, here's the state that I think the receiver has, state 3, and I want to get him to state 9, so could you please give me a diff between state 3 and state 9? And that's just a string. And that's what we convey over the network. And the object also has to support the inverse operation, patch, to say, OK, number three, here's a patch. Please mutate yourself to state number nine. So any kind of object that supports that interface can be conveyed over this protocol. Uh, but it's, we don't know really the meaning of the object or the meaning of diff and patch, you know, whether it's reliable, whether it's exactly the same or not. It's the object's implementation that ultimately defines the semantics of the protocol, not SSP. So here's a diagram of SSH. This is the system we all know and, and have modest affection for. Um, there's the application Emacs on the left. It gets conveyed over TCP, encrypted TCP, to our terminal on the right. So we're going to fill this in. Here's, SS, here's MOSH. Here's the design of MOSH. So instead of just conveying that octet stream, we actually represent explicitly in blue here the state that we're synchronizing. We run two copies of SSP, two copies of the protocol. The version from server to client synchronizes this screen object. So we run a terminal emulator at the server. That spits out these screen objects, and that's what we synchronize. Uh, at whatever rate we want, and we feed that to the client's terminal emulator, uh, like Xterm, and in the reverse direction, we just synchronize the keystrokes that you type. Uh, some of the more minor details, it's protected by one of these authenticated encryption modes. Uh, there's no privileged code in the entire project. Nothing is root. You don't have to be root to install it. No daemons. Uh, we use SSH to authenticate you in the first place. And this design makes it very easy to roam, because we're not using TCP anymore. We're not bound to IP addresses. So roaming becomes trivial. The server just says, OK, what is the latest authentic datagram that I receive from the client, the latest one, and whatever the source IP address and port number of that datagram is, OK, that's my new target I'm going to send all my new packets to. So this is the simplest possible way to do roaming. Uh, it works very well, and it means the client doesn't even have to know that it's roamed. The client could be behind a NAT, and the NAT roamed, uh, where that's still OK. 
Uh, we, have, we try to do fancy flow control. The goal is never fill up a buffer. We can skip over states in between. That's OK. And we have some tricks that we describe elsewhere to try and balance the robustness of the connection versus the throughput. OK, now let's talk about the local user interface. So this is the diagram I showed you. But actually, we're going to add one little feature in the upper right, bloop, the predictive local echo. So instead of rendering directly the server's screen state, we mutate a little bit based on what we think is going to appear. We have a simple algorithm for this. The client runs a predictive model of the, user's, of, the, of the application's behavior. The client runs a predictive model of the application's behavior in the background. We think when you type, it's probably going to be echoed. But we're not sure, because about 30% of the time, what you type isn't echoed. Like in VI, you hit I to insert. You know, that and I never appears on the screen. Uh, so we, we try and make these predictions in groups we call epics. And the hypothesis is that any epic is either entirely echoed or, or not echoed. And so we start predicting just in the background. If any prediction with an epic gets confirmed, then we show the whole epic. And if we make a mistake, no big deal. We just take away the epic. Uh, and if, we, if the user does something that we don't know how to handle, like it's the enter key you know, or, or up and down, we're not sure it's going to happen, we just increment the epic. So we keep predicting, but it's in the background. So this turns out to work pretty well. And I'll show you a demo here. Uh, we're connected back to, to my desktop. On the top screen, we're typing in MOSH. On the bottom screen, we're typing in SSH. And then just is running over the conference Wi-Fi. So if the Wi-Fi is good, we're not going to see a big difference. So this is a real not rigged demo. Uh, let's see here. So hello, use Nix. I am happy to be here. OK, so that's basically similar. Now let's say, you know, the conference Wi-Fi is terrible. You guys could have helped me out there. Let's switch over to the Sprint EVDO network. So we're roaming here. Uh, disconnect it. Now, Mosh gives you this helpful error message. Hey, the network's unreachable. And then it goes away. Hey, you know, I haven't heard from the server in a while. OK, everything's good now. So now it appears we've roamed in both terminals. Mosh, everything looks good. SSH, everything looks good. Hey, let's, let's keep typing. Uh, boy, am I happy that worked. Oh my god, what's happening? So Mosh keeps working. SSH is totally dead, but it doesn't even tell us it's dead. That is the most offensive part of SSH. So now we have to do this dance. We have to kill it, and then SSH again. This is like, I, I could have graduated by now. Um, OK. So now this is over the uh, Sprint 1A. Let's put, throw in a download here just to make it more fun. Testing what happens when I type on the top with Mosh. And so you can see if I try and edit, type very aggressively on the top. Whoops. So you can see it's just much more pleasant here. And it underlines to show, you know, hey, these haven't been confirmed by the server yet. This is another, another test. So you just you really couldn't even expect to use SSH and still enjoy life. So that's the demo. Um, we evaluated at the details of the evaluation in the paper. We found 70% of user keystrokes can be displayed instantly. So our median user interface response is zero. It works over lossy links. We found that Unicode on Unix is still full of bugs. Uh, the details of that are on our website. But you can see if you echo the same string to four different terminal emulators, you get the circumflex in four different places. The Mac OS version has a particularly unique interpretation. Um, <laughs> So we put a lot of work into making this a, a well-baked application that you could use. It's distributed with all kinds of versions of Linux, and it's in the Mac, the various Mac and FreeBSD ports collections. It works sort of on Sigwin and Solaris, and even less on Android. In April, someone else posted it before we were ready to all these news sites, slash dot, barra punto, the Spanish slash dot. Um, 1,200 people have signed up to get a notice when we ever fix a bug. This is where we immodestly show our admiring tweets. Uh, we got, you know, it, it seems to have struck a, a nerve with people. Also, we got a rise out of the Usenix reviewers, uh, which we enjoyed. So people seem to be really using it. Um, but we think that you know, this is not just about a mobile shell protocol. Uh, this sort of paradigm of object synchronization we think is appropriate for other applications. Uh, our, our program can roam. But even very, very well-funded applications for mobile devices, nominally intended for mobility, are not mobile. Android, Gmail, Google Chat, Skype, Gmail, the website, all of these things will break without even disclosing it when you roam. That's just ridiculous. Uh, this is a snapshot from yesterday from my Android device. I sent this email on February 6th, or I tried to. But as I was walking out of our building, the device, you know, I lost the Wi-Fi signal, so it roamed to the cellular connection. But because it happened right in the middle of the transfer, Gmail got confused. And this email still four months later has not been sent. So I, Jessica's like wondering where I am. If any Google employees in the office you want to come up after the break, help me send this email, I'd appreciate it. Uh, but the, the, point, <laughs> the point is that the old way of writing these programs for mobile devices, they, it doesn't make them mobile. And they should be. Uh, this is crazy. Other people should, should adopt this paradigm, we argue. Uh, so in summary, we made SSP a new protocol. We made Mosh, which uses it. 
which has become very popular, but we argue that this paradigm uh, is probably useful, we hope, for other applications and, and should deserve further review. Uh, we encourage you to visit the web page, and I'm honored to have your questions. Questions? Next speaker. Lois Bennett from um, around here. Um, <laughs> we're trying to use this. Someone has asked for this uh, to be installed on our systems. But I'm behind a firewall, and I want to know what ports I have to open and what, what arguments I'm going to get from network security, which aren't very friendly to us. Sure, I'm happy to talk to you about that. Uh, in general, um, you, know, you, have to, you have to open as many ports on the machine as you want concurrent connections, because that's how we identify uh, the connection, is just by the port number, since the IP address can change. So if you want to allow 10 connections to a machine, you have to open 10 ports. That's, that's the story. But uh, we're working on, on uh, a better answer to that question. Okay, thank you. Time for one more. Uh, what is an analogy for that predictive echo for Gmail? Is there any? Or well, is that I think like Gmail shell specific? already has a pretty good local user interface. And when you type, uh, you do see what you're typing immediately. So I don't think Gmail is actually as bad as the, as the terminal application. Thanks. OK, thank you very much. Thank you.